Okay, the chapters that we're dealing with tonight are chapter 12, 13, and 14, understanding the Bible, what the Bible is, and developing an effective Bible study. First of all, coming to the Bible, we have got some things there in our notes, and I've got some of our notes uh, put into the presentation tonight. The reasons why some people don't understand the Bible, well, firstly, some don't study the Bible, then some, some study with a closed mind, some are hindered by tradition, some try and prove a point, some do not love the truth, some are blinded by worldly living, some study the Bible in a disorganized manner. First of all, some don't study the Bible, but we are told in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. That means that we study so that we can correctly interpret the Bible. Secondly, some study with a closed mind. Also in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, it says this, Know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, unthankful, unholy, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So there are people, even though they study and they're always learning, they never get a grasp on the truth because they are boastful and covetous and proud. They haven't dealt with these areas in their lives. Thirdly, some are hindered by tradition. One of the reasons that people don't understand the Bible is that the authority of the Bible has been undermined, and often this has been done by making something else as valid as the Bible, like church tradition. Jesus spoke of this in Matthew 15, verse 6 and 9. He says, Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Then some try and prove a point. Some people are fixated on some pet doctrine, and everything they look at in Scripture is seen through that lens. For example, if someone is a staunch Calvinist, in other words, they believe, um, one of the things they believe is that once saved, always saved, and uh, believes that a Christian can never lose their salvation, they see all scripture through that lens. And when something in scripture doesn't line up with what they believe, they twist scripture to suit their preconceived viewpoint. They disregard context and rules of interpretation to prove what they have decided is a fact. Instead of seeing if what they believe stands up under the scrutiny of scripture. Then some do not love the truth. It's why they don't understand the Bible. They interpret scripture in the light of their own pet doctrines. Some do this to gain popularity and prosperity, tickling people's ears with palatable gospel that doesn't offend. Paul warned of those who would turn from the truth to get a following. In Acts 20, he says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock, even from your own men will arise from your own number. Men will arise who will distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. In Philippians 1, 15 to 18, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. So sad to say that some people actually preach the gospel for the wrong reason. But the amazing thing is that God can even use the message preached with the wrong motives, and he can work in people's lives. Some are blinded by worldly living. 1 Timothy 6, 3 to 5 says this, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus, 
and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth, who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Then some study the Bible in a disorganized manner. We will look at Bible study methods later and we can see how we can study more effectively. Now, what the Bible is, there's three basic Christian truths. God exists, he's revealed himself in an understandable way, and his revelation has been preserved for us in the Bible. So the Bible is God's revelation of himself to man. And that's the reason why Satan always attacks God's word. He attacks its, uh, its origin. He says it's not God-breathed. He says, how can the Bible be inspired? And we see how atheists and people that have been sort of uh, under the influence of these satanic temptations come up with these arguments. The, onth the authenticity of the Bible is attacked. The accusation is made that it has many mistakes and contradictions. They can't show you any of them, but they say they're there. And so you can pick and choose what you want to believe. The authority of the word of God is attacked. So if the Bible was written by men, they say it's full of errors. How could it be the authority of my life? And then they attack the power of the word of God. When you doubt the origin, authenticity, and authority of God's word, it loses its transforming power. And when a person begins to doubt God's word, then their world revolves around themselves. They've got no room for God or his control. And in society, humanism is the rousing religion. And that's because Satan has blinded men's eyes to the word of God. So secular humanism is the idea that man has created God in his own mind. And so the attitude is we can make up our own morals. We don't need to go by the morals of the Bible. But the Christian worldview believes in God, and they believe that God made man in his own image, and so the Bible sets out the principles of how we should live. Now, the Bible is an old book. It's not something new. The, in the time of Jesus, the, the Old Testament obviously was already there. They had the Septuagint, which was in Greek for the people of the day. And the New Testament was written within the first hundred years of um, after, um, after Christ's birth. Um, they were written between 55 and 96 AD. And then in the next century, they were all collected and, you know, read in the churches. And they got the canon sorted out in the late 300s. Now, this is also, you know, just from the notes, a few things. Well, the scripture obviously is from the Bible. It says here in Hebrews 1, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. So revelation is important. And this is what it says in, in the notes that you've got there. Revelation is God uncovering or revealing his will directly to man. He reveals his will through dreams and visions, through by speaking mouth to mouth. And that's how I think it says in Numbers 12, he conversed with Moses by putting the exact words in the mouth of the prophet. He spoke through angels. He spoke through his son, Jesus. And another form of revelation refers to the indirect revealing of God by means of a created world. In other words, we look at creation and we can see in nature how God has spoken and revealed himself. Now, God's revelation to man and to Satan is spoken of here in Ephesians 3. Paul says, This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So notice his intent was through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities of the heavenly realms. So this is not speaking about men. This is speaking about Satan. So now Satan knows the gospel 
and God's plan of redemption. However, he's made it his mission to keep man in the dark because revelation is not enough. We need illumination. So even though the Bible is freely available and a person can go into a shop quite freely and get a Bible, um, even when people read the Bible, Satan blinds them so that they don't understand. Because revelation is not enough. We need illumination. Now, illumination means not just reading where you see God revealing himself. It's you actually start understanding. It starts making sense. So in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4 and verse 6, it says, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Now, veiled means that it's hidden. Okay? When a woman gets married, she puts a veil over her face. Okay? So that's what it's saying. If the gospel is veiled. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Mark 4 verse 11 and 12 says, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. But those on the outside, he says, everything is said in parables to them, that they may be ever seen but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. So he does this because, he goes on to say, their hearts have become hard. Mark 4 says, do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, you put it on a stand. For what is hidden is meant to be disclosed. What is concealed is meant to be brought into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So in other words, if there's things that you don't understand in the Bible, the Lord says what is hidden is meant to be disclosed. So he will give you understanding. But there's a principle. If you have ears, and it's not just talking about this, it's talking about hearing in your heart. Consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So in other words, if, you, if God tells you to do something, do it. Whoever, ha whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, what he, even what he has will be taken away from him. So who, it's, um, another version says, whoever hears will be given more. Whoever does not hear, even what he has will be taken away. So in other words, if God tells you to do something and you don't do it, he's not going to tell you anything more because you already haven't done what he's already told you. So he who hears and hearing, spiritual hearing, is not just, okay, I heard you. It's actually obeying. It's doing it. This Now, although Plato is a philosopher, there's a lot of truth in this. But he probably thinks of light as human knowledge. We know differently. He says, we can easily forgive a child who's afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. And men are afraid of the light. They're afraid of Jesus. John 3.19 says, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. But men preferred the darkness to the light because their deeds were evil. 2 Peter 1.19 and we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. So he, Peter's saying, you've got the word of the prophets. You've got the Old Testament because they had the Septuagint. And he says, you do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns. And the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. That's illumination. That's when Jesus becomes a reality and you understand, yes, he is who he says he is. But the fact of the matter is even that's not enough. Because the disciples, ach, the leaders in the day of Jesus, it said many of them believed in him. But they didn't appropriate, they didn't apply it in their lives. You know, if you go to the doctor and the doctor says to you, you're sick, you've actually got uh, sugar diabetes, um, I'm going to give you this medication, this insulin, you must take it. Now you go home, you realize the doctor said you got sugar diabetes, you know you've got it, and you believe you've got it, but you don't take the medicine. Nothing's going to happen because you haven't appropriated that knowledge. And this is what happens here in John 12. Many 
at the same time among the believers believed in him. Oh, I don't know what I did there. Let's just see. Okay. I think I hit the blank key or something. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue for they loved praise from men more than praise from God. So these Pharisees, ach, these leaders, they believed in Jesus, but it says because they were scared of the Pharisees, they didn't confess him. And remember, Jesus said, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. If you deny me before man, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. Because salvation, there must be confession. It says in Romans 10, if you believe in your heart, verse 9, and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. So we need to not just believe in our hearts, we need to confess. We mustn't be ashamed of Jesus. Romans 10, verse 8 to 10, the word is near you. It's in your mouth, in your heart. That word of faith we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So revelation is this. You believe Jesus is a savior. So you read the Bible and you come to the place where you say, I do believe that Jesus is a savior, but that's not enough. You need illumination and you need to realize that Jesus is the savior. There's no other one. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father but by him. But that's not enough. You've got to appropriate it and you've got to get to the place where you say, Jesus is my savior. Now, all scripture is God inspired. In, oh, sorry, I bumped this. In 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21, it says, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable and you do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Okay, we've just looked at that scripture, just a reminder. And it goes on to say, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in man's will, never had its origin in human will. But the prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now look what Jesus said about the scriptures. In Luke 24, Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, how did they know what the prophets had spoken? Because it's recorded in the Old Testament and in the scriptures that they had. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter glory? And these things are prophesied in the Old Testament. And beginning with Moses and with the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He said this in Luke 24, verse 44. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures and he told them this is what he's written. The Messiah will suffer. Where does it speak about this? Well, one of the scriptures is Isaiah 53. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before its shearers is a dumb, so I open not his mouth. So we see this is what Jesus is referring to. The prophecies about what was going to happen to him are in the scripture. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached. In his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses to these things. This is the conversation he is having with two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus after he had rose, risen from the dead. Okay, now this is also from your notes, the unity of the Bible, this page. The Bible is a collection of 66 books and letters. They were written over a period of time from 1400 BC to 96 AD. 
That's a period of about 1,500 years. Approximately 40 men were involved in its writing. Many Bible writers have referred to one another's writings throughout the history of its writings. The writers did their writing at different times in history, though. They lived in different locations. They came from different cultural backgrounds. In the view of these facts, the Bible absolutely could not have been an invention of man. It is its unity. It is a unity of inspiration from God for man's guidance. From Genesis to Revelation, the theme of the Bible is God's plan to save man from sin. All the teachings to guide man to have a right relationship with God and his fellow man are harmonious throughout the Bible. There are no contradictions. There are no inconsistencies. Those who do not know the Bible claim that it contradicts itself. But when one studies the Bible, this accusation quickly disappears. Men could never have produced a piece of unified literature like the Bible alone. Now, Homer is uh, someone who was a blind poet in ancient Greece. And there's a saying about his writings, Homer must be handled with care. The allusion, of course, is to the compositions of this blind poet of ancient Greek. Greece. The implication in the proverb is Homer's works have been treasured and preserved cautiously for centuries. And yet in spite of this meticulous care, only a few copies of his writings survive. There's no complete copy of the poet's works prior to the 13th century AD, more than 2,000 years after the writer lived. In contrast, the Bible, though viciously opposed and oppressed across Several millennia is reflected in thousands of Hebrew and Greek manuscripts and even today continues to be the best-selling publication in the world. Now look at the social impact of the Bible. We know how Christianity went into places in Africa, in New Guinea, and in places where people were cannibals and people used to kill each other and do terrible things. And when the gospel came and the Bible was brought and people were changed, it affected society. People's behavior changed. In fact, the law that we have nowadays was based on the Bible. No work of literature in history has ever influenced societies more than the Bible. Literally billions of people in history have been touched by the scriptures. Certainly, if it were the invention of men alone, it would have not had such an impact on history. People have been brought out of cannibalism and slavery. Practices like sati where they used to, if a man died, they used to take his wives and they used to kill them as well and burn them on top of the thing. Infanticide, where people used to take their babies and throw them in the river and let them die. That's been outlawed. Sadly, in our modern day era, as secular humanism, uh, humanists have tried to eradicate the Judeo-Christian influence and have had certain parts of the Bible declared as hate speech. We've seen a return to barbaric practices like abortion and the parading of perversion as an alternative lifestyle. So what we see happening in our day and age is men going back to their barbaric behavior before Christianity brought enlightenment and change. The historical Jesus, if you just look at Jesus from a historical point of view, there are 10 non-Christian writers who mention Jesus within 150 years of his life. And this is people who are not Christians. By contrast, over the same 150 years, there are nine non-Christian sources who mention Tiberius Caesar, the Roman emperor. So in other words, Jesus is mentioned more, one more time than Caesar. Nobody says, oh, well, Caesar didn't live. But some people try and doubt Jesus. Jesus is actually mentioned by one more source than the Roman emperor at the time. But if you include the Christian authors who mention Jesus, they outnumber them 43 to 10. If you just look at the prophecies that are fulfilled in the Bible, there are 2,500 prophecies in the Bible. 2,000 have already been fulfilled to the letter, no error. 300 prophecies in total were fulfilled by Jesus. The odds of one man fulfilling just eight prophecies 
are one in one and look at all those noughts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 noughts. Okay. So that's the odds of one man fulfilling eight prophecies, but Jesus fulfilled 300. Essentially impossible, which shows that God had to be involved. These prophecies were made before Jesus even came and appeared on the, be uh, on the scene. His birth was prophesied in Micah 5.2. His date of birth in Daniel 9.25. His manner of birth in Isaiah 7.14. His manner of death in Zechariah 12.10 and in Psalm 22.16. Prophesied before the invention of crucifixion. It spoke about how Jesus was going to die. His burial was prophesied in Isaiah 53.9 where it says he made his grave with the rich because he was given a rich man's tomb. But he only used it for the weekend. Developing an effective Bible study. Okay. Now, it's important to study the Bible, and these are just some tips that I want to give you. Schedule time every week just for studying the Word. A vital element of an effective Bible study is prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to be your teacher before reading the Bible. Psalm 119, 18 says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. In the same Psalm, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Psalm 119 is actually a very good psalm to read through. And, uh, you know, take your time just meditating upon because it deals just with the word of God. How to get to know the word of God. If you look at that hand, okay, five fingers, yeah, read, study, and memorize and meditate. Now, if you take your hand like that, you can touch each one of those fingers with your thumb. Okay, hear the word of God, meditate. Read the word of God, meditate. Study the word of God, meditate. Memorize the word of God, meditate. Okay, so those are five scriptures that mention, you know, those methods. So hearing, which is the first one, it says in John 6, so when they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled the 12 baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Now, how do you apply this scripturally? Well, if you come to a meeting, remember the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. So if we come and we're going to feed on the bread of life, we need to gather up fragments afterwards and, uh, so that we can have something to eat later. And the principle there is take notes. Or fortunately, in our modern day and age, with the technology we have, we've got recordings. We've got the internet. We can go and we can listen to it over and over again. So in other words, we don't just eat once. You actually gather up the fragments and taping and putting it on the internet is just like getting a basket and taking some of the fragments so that you can have something later. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then through reading, Revelation 1, 3 says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Methods of reading the Bible that you must avoid, though, is first of all the box of chocolates. Now, what people do is they get a promise box, and that promise box has got scriptures in, some very nice scriptures. But that's the problem. They're only nice scriptures. There's nothing in there that, that tells you that Jesus said that all who will follow uh, him are going to suffer persecution. All who would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Those kind of things are not there. And you know, we need meat. We need bread. We need food. You can't live on chocolates. And that's what those promise boxes are like. It's just got nice scriptures. That's the kind of scriptures that people put on their fridge. But then they avoid the rest of the Bible that has got some things that they don't like. Another method that people have of reading the Bible is deep sea fishing. Okay, they look for something that's hidden. 
supposedly you read that and then they say, no, but that's not what it means. And then they try and find another explanation that has nothing to do with what they've just read. The lucky dip method, that's like flipping through the Bible. Now, you know, I've heard people use this as a testimony as young believers, and I can still understand a person who does things as a child or as an immature Christian. You know, when our children are small, we make room for them, you know. If they don't know how to say please or thank you, we will still give them what they need, and then one day, you know, they'll get to the place where they know how to ask properly, and they'll know how to thank you. But that's the thing is, a lucky dip method is not a method that a person can keep with as you mature and as you, you know, get to um, study the Bible. And, uh, you know, I've heard the saying that somebody said that this person flipped through the Bible and they opened it up and it said Judas went and hanged himself. And they didn't like that one, so they closed it. And then they flipped their Bible open and put their finger down and it said, um, go there and do likewise. <laughs> and they didn't like that one. They closed it again and they opened it and they put their finger on something and it says, that which you must do, go do quickly. So that's just something lighthearted to show you that it's not a good way of getting to know the word of God or getting direction. We need to read the Bible in a proper systematic way. We need to study it because the Holy Spirit will bring it to remembrance, but he's not going to read the Bible for us. We need to get it into our hearts. First aid method, only going to use the Bible in emergencies. And that's what some people use their Bible for. It's like a first aid, only when they've got problems, then they suddenly go to the Bible. Okay, the third way to get to know the Bible is to study it. And in Acts 17, verse 11, it says, Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So they didn't just accept what Paul said. They studied, and they made sure it was in the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto men, uh, unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, some study methods if you want to study the Bible. First of all, you can do a character study. You can take a person like Simon Peter and you can study his life and you can see how he was when he started off and how he developed and how he eventually ended up to be a great preacher and how he eventually ended up giving his life for the call that's on his life. You can study a topical or thematic study. You can look at faith and you can go through the Bible and you can study faith and look at all the scriptures that talk about faith or do a word study or a verse analysis. Just look at a verse and break it down and do a study on that or you can analyze a chapter and see what the chapter does or you can even take a book of the bible take james and just study that and see what the whole theme is and you can combine a character study and a topical study in other words the faith of simon peter okay we know he got out the boat he walked on the water so you can combine two things in a study the fourth thing Fourth way to get to know God's word is to memorize God's word. So remember, it's hear, read, study, memorize. Proverbs 7, 1 to 3. My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers Write them on the tablet of your heart. How can you write God's word on your heart? The only way you can do that is by memorizing it. And when somebody asks you something, you can say, oh, well, this is what the Bible says. And you don't have to go and look through your Bible because you've memorized it. There are many people who have benefited in countries where they've been forbidden to have the Bible. And um, they've obviously memorized the Bible when they've had it. And they've been put in prison and at least they have got the word of God hidden in their heart. That's what the psalmist says. Thy word have I hidden my heart. How do you hide your God's word in your heart? You memorize it so that I might not sin against you. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly 
in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Deuteronomy 11, 18 to 21 says, Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you walk down the road, when you lie down, when you get up. We're not supposed to sit and watch TV the whole day. And, uh, you know, you read your Bible for a couple of minutes before you fall asleep at night and you're dead tired, you don't take anything in. This should be something that's a central part of our lives, central part of our home life. Write them on the door frames of your houses, on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land. The Lord God swore to your ancestors, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. Then fifthly, meditate upon the word. And remember, this goes hand in hand with the four previous methods. Okay, so you hear, you meditate. You read, you meditate. You study, you meditate. You memorize the word of God, you meditate. Joshua 1.8, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be pro prosperous and successful. Ponder what you have read. Think about what you've read. Is there a mistake that you need to avoid? Is there a command that you need to obey? Is there a sin that you need to put off? Is there a promise that you need to believe and trust God for? Think about what you've read and don't be in a hurry. Psalm 1 verse 1 and 2 said, Blessed is the man who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Now, we need to be careful about interpreting the Bible. We can't just read into the Bible and say this is what it means. We must be aware of what the writer was wanting to do. You see, when you write a letter to your mother, your mother knows you, and so she'll know, oh, yeah, well, this is what you mean. Anything that might not be too easy to understand, it helps because she knows you. And if she knows you, she'll know how to interpret. And the same goes, is when we've got a relationship with the Lord and with the Holy Spirit, we will have more wisdom. But there are certain other things which we need to be very careful of, and that is we need to pay attention to the context. So in other words, don't just read one scripture. Read the scriptures before. Read the scriptures after. See how it fits into the chapter. Consider the simple and most obvious meaning is correct. Don't try and make things complicated. Often the Bible's just telling you to do something and you just need to do it. Isn't, uh, uh, God's not trying to trick you. The Bible itself is its best interpretation. We need to study the Old Testament out of the view of the New Testament. And when you see something, it's always best to go and look for other scriptures. Don't build a doctrine or a belief on one scripture. You need to see that that scripture is mentioned in a number of scriptures so that you can build a firm foundation. Hermeneutics is the theory and the methodology of interpretation of biblical text. The distinction between exegesis and hermeneutics is a thin line. Hermeneutics is a field of study which is concerned with how we interpret the Bible, whereas exegesis is the actual interpretation of the Bible by drawing the meaning out of the biblical text. Okay, so you look at the actual scripture and you, you draw the meaning out of that. So you need to pay attention to these methods. So five clues that I can give you to help you to determine the author's main point or points is, first of all, context, as I said. You can answer 75% of your questions about the passage when you read it in the, the whole text and not just the one verse. Look at everything before and after. 
then cross-reference, as I said. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. That is, let other passages in the Bible shed light on the passage that you're looking at. Then culture. The Bible was written long ago, so when we interpret it, we need to understand it was written from the writer's cultural context, okay? And that helps sometimes as well. Conclusion. Having answered your questions for understanding by means of context, cross-reference, and culture, you can make a preliminary statement of the passage's meaning. And then consultation, reading commentaries, which are written by Bible scholars. That can also help you interpret Scripture. But use the commentaries last. Sometimes what people do is they go to the commentary first of all, and then they don't get their own ideas. They don't open themselves to the Holy Spirit's leading. They just develop a certain opinion because that's what the person who is given the commentary believes. And so you believe what someone else believes. Okay. I just put that in um, for those on the internet who want to get it. It's quite a good thing, a diary of the Bible. But that's my last slide. Any questions?